you might be sitting there, if you're not saved, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't been born again, you might be sitting there saying, what's the matter with these people? They get all excited and they sing and they cry and they raise their hand and they go on and on about a guy who lived and died some 2,000 years ago. I want you to just really stop and think about a few things before we get into this. You may not believe that, that what we believe is the truth, but I want to tell you something. Jesus has been historically proven, archaeologically proven. There's no doubt that he did live. There is no doubt that he did the things that the Bible tells us that he did. There's no doubt that they took him and they hung him on a cross and they crucified him. All these things are facts. You can't argue with them. They are facts. They have been proven. They are written down in history and they are there. And you may agree with that part and you say, well, this was just a man. This was just somebody who was a good teacher or a good moral person or some kook trying to start a new religion or whatever it is that you may think. But I want you to hear me this morning. I want you to really listen to what I tell you this morning. There is historical evidence for Jesus' existence. There is also evidence written down in historical documents by non-believers that say that something strange happened after that man was hung on that cross and after that man was laid in that tomb. Something strange happened. There was a stir, there was a buzz. That body that had been laid in that tomb somehow just went away. There's all kinds of things that people will tell you what happened to that body that was laid in that tomb. Well, maybe the dogs came and they ate up that body. Maybe his followers, they came and they stole that body. We're going to address a few of these things this morning and get into a few other things. I just want to ask you to do one thing. I want you to listen to what the Word of God says and you listen with an open mind and you hear what it is that the Word of God has to say and then you weigh the evidence and you weigh what it is that you hear here this morning and then you make your decision. We've gathered here early this morning because uh, we celebrate on this day the resurrection of our Lord and of our Savior. And the account that we have of that resurrection begins at a dawn. And that's where I want to break in here in the Word of God in Matthew chapter 28. The first verse says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Early on that morning, that Sunday morning, these ladies came. It was their intention to come and to anoint that body with spices and with things like that, which was their custom. But it was dawn. The, the sun was just beginning to come up, and the light was just beginning to break over the horizon when they were on that way to that sepulcher. Now, just a few days before that, something tragic had happened. The one that they had followed, the one that they had believed in, the one that they had accepted as being the Messiah, the one they had accepted as being the Christ, had been hung on a cross and had been crucified. The day before had been the Sabbath, and on the Sabbath, no work was done. So that cross was probably still standing where it was when that, that event had occurred. And, and it was on a hill there somewhere, and as the sun came up on their, on their way to that sepulcher, to that sepulcher, they could probably see that cross silhouetted against the sky up there on the hill. And as they looked up on that cross, that cross was empty. There was nothing on that cross. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about the emptiness of Easter, about the emptiness of that event and that occurrence and the things that are associated with that. That cross is standing up there. It's silhouetted against the sun coming up, and it is empty. But if you can get a close look at that cross, it is blood-soaked. It, it has been just so full with blood it is stained the blood had been just poured out on that cross it was so blood soaked because the man that they had hung on that cross had been severely beaten and tortured he had been whipped with what we would call a cat of nine tails a scourge that the Romans used it had all these leather thongs on it on the end of those thongs they had bones or pieces of metal or pieces of clay and they beat him and they beat him and they beat 
him with that thing. And when that bone or that clay or that metal would come in contact with the skin, it would dig in. And when they would yank it back, it would yank out chunks of flesh. It tore him up. It literally made him look like hamburger. The Bible tells us in one place that he was so marred, he was unrecognizable. He had shed huge amounts of blood from those wounds that he had received. And then they took him and they laid him down on that old rugged piece of wood with the splinters digging into that where it had already been all torn up and had already been mutilated. And every time that he moved, it just dug in and it made the blood flow more. And it made the blood flow more. And not only that, they put a crown of thorns on his head and they drove it down in so that those thorns dug down into his scalp and the blood flowed down his face from those thorns that were dug into him. And not only that, they drove nails into his ribs. They drove nails into his feet and the blood flowed. And not only that, they took a spear and they stuck it in his side and the blood flowed and that cross was just soaked in blood. This man had been tortured. This man had been abused. He had lost massive amounts of blood. And as he hung there on that cross, if you've ever read anything or studied anything about crucifixion when you're hanging there, you can't support the weight of your body and your lungs fill up and you drown inside of yourself. If he didn't die from that, he may have died from the blood loss. He may have died from shock. He may have died from any number of things. His heart could have failed. He could have had a coronary. If you study crucifixion, all of these things are feasible. All of these things happened when the Romans put somebody on a cross and treated them in such a manner. There is no way that you could do what was done to this man and hang him up there and expect him to live. I'm going to tell you, Jesus Christ died on that cross. There is no doubt that he died on that cross. And you go back and you read, the soldiers knew he died. They checked because what they did, because the Sabbath was the next day, and the Jews had a tradition that those bodies couldn't hang there on the Sabbath. They came to the Romans and they told them to go and break the legs of the people hanging on the cross because if they would break their legs, they could no longer support themselves. They would drop down, their lungs would fill up with fluid, and they would die. So the Romans did that. They came to the two thieves that had been crucified also on that day, and they broke their legs so that they would die. But when they came to Christ, they saw that he was already dead. I'm going to tell you something about these Romans. They were masters of death. They knew death. And when they came to him, they said he was already dead. Those soldiers knew Christ had died. There was no doubt that he was dead. The soldiers knew it. The Romans knew it. And the Jews knew it. But I want to tell you something. They didn't want it to be known. So what they did was they got together and they made up a lie. Listen to this. They took him off of the cross and he was laid in a tomb. And then listen to what happened. In the book of Matthew chapter 28, verse 2, And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Who are those keepers? Those are the Roman soldiers. The Jews asked for a, a legion of soldiers, a, a, a squad of soldiers to be placed at the tomb so that the body couldn't be stolen. And the Bible tells us that when this angel appeared, these keepers, this squad of soldiers, became as dead men. We jump over to verse 11 of that chapter. It says, and now... When they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Listen to this. They knew he was dead, but they didn't want this to be known. So they told the soldiers, we're going to pay you to say that his disciples came and 
stole the body away from you. We're going to pay you to say that. And what the Bible tells us here, that this is commonly known and was commonly told. You go back and you read the history, not the biblical history, not the religious history. You read the secular history. This is recorded in history that it was told that those disciples came and they stole that body. I'm going to tell you something. These Roman soldiers would have never slept on watch because if they would have went to sleep on watch, they would have lost their lives. These Romans were a cruel bunch of people and they would not have put up with that. They would have not been sleeping on watch. And there's no way those disciples could have come and overpowered a group of soldiers, a legion of soldiers, a squad of soldiers. This 11 right neck bunch of followers of Christ could not have come and overpowered their soldiers. Let's assume that they did somehow. How were they going to move a two-ton stone from in front of that door, from in front of that opening, from that place where Christ was laid? It was impossible for that to happen. It could not have happened. He was dead. He was placed in that tomb, and something happened to bring him out of that tomb. As I said, it was said, the, the disciples stole him. Dogs came and ate him. How the dogs moved the stone. They have all kinds of things. But they could not have happened. It is impossible for any of those other things to have happened. So what did happen? This is exactly what happened. Let me read you this again. There was a great earthquake. The angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone Amen. from the door and sat on it. That's what happened. But I want to back up a minute. I want you to hear this. They knew he was dead, and they took him off of that cross. That cross was now empty. But there's something great about the emptiness of that cross. Because that cross is empty, it tells us that we can be forgiven. I'm going to tell you something. Sin has a penalty. The penalty for sin is death. Because God is a righteous and a holy God, he cannot abide sin. And sin cannot enter into his presence. And the only thing that can pay for sin is death. And the only thing that can pay that penalty is a perfect sacrifice. None of us have meet that criteria. None of us are able to pay the debt that is owed. None of us are able to present a perfect sacrifice to God to pay that penalty for sin. There's only one who ever lived that was perfect and could pay that penalty. His name is Jesus Christ. And he is the only one who was ever born and was perfect and could pay that penalty. Muhammad couldn't do it. Buddha couldn't do it. Allah couldn't do it. Only Jesus Christ could do it. And he came and that's why he hung on that cross. That's why that cross was blood soaked because he paid that penalty for sin and for death. The Bible tells us that all have sinned. There is no one who has ever been born who has not sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Bible also tells us that the penalty for sin is death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And the soul that sins shall surely die. Except that. Because of that empty cross, because of that blood-soaked cross, that penalty has been paid. It opens a door. It makes a way that we can have forgiveness of those sins that each and every one of us carry. That empty cross is a promise to everyone who's ever been born that there is a way of escape, that that penalty has been paid, and that you don't have to pay it. I want to go back to where we were reading. The Bible says that there was a great earthquake and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord led. That tomb was now empty. Amen. He is not there anymore. And I guarantee you, the disciples didn't steal the body. Dogs didn't eat the body. He was risen as he said he would rise. Amen. Bob Mitch 
did up here this morning. He said, in three days, I will raise this up. In three days, I will rebuild this house. He said, tear it down. And in three days, I will raise it up. And that's exactly what happened. And that angel came and rolled back that stone, not so that he could get out. He didn't need that stone removed so that he could get out, so that they could see in and see the proof of what he had promised. They could see that that tomb was now empty. They could see that he was no longer lying there, but that he had come forth, and that now he was alive, and that now he would live forevermore. And because that tomb is empty, because of the emptiness of that tomb, we have another promise. Because he lives, we can live. Because he has defeated death, because he has conquered death, because he has taken the sting of death, we can live. We don't have to fear death anymore. Death is not something that we have to be scared of anymore. Death no longer has a sting. There was a father and there was a son, and they were in their car, and a bee was in the car, and it was buzzing around the sun, and he was scared of this bee because he was allergic, and if he got stung by this bee, it would cause him all kinds of problems. But what the father did was he reached over and he grabbed that bee, and he held that bee, and then he let it go again, and the bee began to fly around the sun again and the father told him you don't have to be scared of that bee anymore look at my hand there's the stinger I took the sting you don't have to fear him anymore yeah that bee is still there but there's no sting in him anymore and that's how it is with that because Christ took the sting out of it it is still there but it is nothing to fear but because of what Christ did we do not die and Christ told us that if any man believe in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and though he die, he will live forever. If any man partakes of Christ, if any man accepts his sacrifice, you might close these eyes and lay this old fleshly body down, but you will never die. That man that lives inside of you, that spiritual man will just move into another plane. He is not going to die. He is going to go and spend eternity with Christ in paradise because of that empty tomb. We have that promise it is a guarantee on the word of God and again I want to remind you of this and I want you to think about this this is historically proven something happened there and you can use one of the excuses I gave you the dogs ate the body if that's the truth you tell me how the dogs moved the two ton stone and got to the body well the disciples stole the body away you tell me how 11 ragtag fishermen and nobodies overcame a squad of Roman soldiers, defeated them, rolled back a stone that weighed two tons, and took that body away. If they did that, they knew that everything that they said was a lie. But they went out and put their life on the line. And almost all of them, all but one, gave their life to uphold a lie, if that's what you want to believe. How many would do that? Just to sustain a lie. Something happened to change these men. Something happened to give these men courage. Something happened to give these men boldness. They were scared. You go back before this happened, they were hiding out because of what had happened to Christ. They were in fear that it was going to happen to them. They were in fear they were going to be locked up. They were going to be beaten. They were going to be tortured. They were going to be killed. So they were all hiding away somewhere. But something happened that changed them, that gave them a boldness to go out right in the face of those who wanted to destroy them and proclaim this message. Something changed them. And I don't think it was a lie that they were willing to go out and face that and put their lives on the line and give their lives for something happened. Again, you understand me. These things are historically proven. No, no one actually physically saw him get up and walk out of there. But they know something happened. Amen. And there is no other plausible explanation. You go and you try to figure it out and you try to come up with an intelligent plausible explanation and we'll talk and I'll talk with you. But there is no other plausible explanation. This is what happened. Because of that empty cross we have a promise 
that we can, we have a promise that we can live Amen. and live forever. That we don't have to die. I want to read you something else. After the women went to the tomb and they saw the angel and they saw that Christ was no longer there, they ran and they went and they told the disciples. And in the book of John chapter 20, we pick up where that's happening. It says, Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he stooping down, and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then come a sign of Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and see if the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. I want to take a look at this. Inside that, that tomb, that sepulchre, that empty place where the body had been laying, the grave clothes were still laying there. Yeah. Now you tell me this. If the dogs came and they ate the body, and what did they do? Did they take the cloth off of it first? Did they fold up the napkin and lay it off to the side before they devoured that body? If the disciples came and they stole away the body, did they unwrap him first and fold up the cloth and lay him off to the side and carry him away that way? If they had truly done this, they would be in a hurry. They would want to be getting out of there before more soldiers came. They would have rushed in. They would have grabbed the body. Body and they would have headed out of there. They wouldn't have took the time to unwrap them and to fold up the cloth and to lay them off to the side. When they got there and they looked into that empty place, there lay the empty grave clothes laying within there. Something had happened. Something amazing had happened. And what had happened there was exactly what I have been telling you. He was resurrected. He came back and he didn't need those old grave clothes anymore. He didn't didn't need to be bound up in the cross that signified death. He didn't need to be wrapped up in something that is only for the dead. He didn't need that anymore because he was alive. He had risen. He was no longer dead and he had no need for the clothes of the dead. He had laid them aside because he was alive. And I'm going to tell you something. Those empty grave clothes meant something to those people because he wasn't dead anymore. He didn't need the clothes of a dead man. Because he wasn't dead anymore, he would be putting on the robe of the living. And because he had the robe of the living, and because he was alive, there was coming a day not too far from right here where they saw this, that he would once again sit with them, and he would once again speak with them, and he would once again fellowship with them. He would eat with them. He would spend time with them. He would be there and they could touch him, and they could see him, and they could hear him. They could have a personal relationship with him. They could have fellowship with him because he is not dead, because he had risen, because he laid aside the clothes of the dead, and he put on the clothes of the living. They could be in touch with him. They could have a personal, one-on-one, -on -one, up close relationship with him. And because of those grave clothes, because of those empty grave clothes, you can have the very same thing. Because he lives, you can have an up close and a personal and a one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. You can sit with him. You can walk with him. You can talk with him. You can hear from him. You're crazy, Brad. You hear from him. He talks to you. You're just hearing some kind of voices. Yeah, I am hearing some kind of voices. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's the voice of Jesus Christ. And it speaks to me down in here. And a voice that's undeniable. And a voice that's very recognizable. No, I don't hear voices in my head. Tell me to go do crazy things. I hear voices in my spirit. I hear voices in my heart. It is the voice of 
of Jesus Christ. And I have as much of a relationship with him as they had with him. It's as personal with me and him as it was with them. I can sit with him. I can talk with him. I can walk with him. I can feel his presence. I can feel his touch because he is real. He is a real savior. He was a real historical person that came to this earth that did everything the Bible said he did. History backs it up. Archaeology backs it up. The Bible backs it up. He is what he says he is. He is what he says he was. He came. He did the things that the Bible says he did. He suffered. The history tells us he suffered. The Bible tells us he suffered. Those Romans beat him. They tortured him. They mutilated him. They hung him on a cross. History tells us that. Archaeology tells us that. And the Bible tells us that. And he died. The Bible tells us he died. History tells us he died. And he rose again. And history won't come right out and tell you that he rose again. But history will tell you something strange happened. Something that had never happened before happened. And because of that, I read it to you in here. You can go and look up the history yourself. Because of that, they made up a lie. They bought off soldiers and they perpetrated that lie so that people would not believe it. But it is the truth. He rose again. He resurrected. He took the sting out of death. He had went down and he descended into hell and he looked Satan right in the eye and he took the key to death, hell, and the grave and they had no power over anyone who accepts that sacrifice. There is no sting in it for you. If you have accepted Christ, if you have made him Lord and Savior, there is no sting in it, but there is a promise in it. That promise that when you close these eyes on this plane, you open them again on a much better one that never ends, that goes on for eternity. Where there is no pain, there is no suffering, there is no anguish, there is no death. It's all good because of that empty cross, because of that empty tomb, because of those empty grave clothes. You can have that. Amen. You may not believe me. You may not believe the word. You may be one of those who thinks, well, we're just here by some cosmic accident. Or we descended from some ooze and something that crawled out of that and then it grew legs and then it grew up, grew hair and then it became a monkey and then the monkey turned into people. Well, your uncle might be a monkey, but mine's not. Amen. And you want to talk about that? We'll talk about that. I can show you that it is impossible for evolution to be true. I can show you that. You want to talk about it? We'll talk. There is only one reasonable, logical explanation for why you are here. You can call him a higher power. You can call him a greater force. But his name is Jehovah. He is God. And he created you. That is why you are here. He created this earth and everything that is in it. And he created you. There is no other logical, explainable explanation. And again, you want to talk about it, we'll talk. And I'll show you that it's impossible for evolution to have happened the way they said that it happened. There is only one explanation. That is that the creator did everything he said he did. And that is why we are here. Well, if that's true, why do I need to accept all this stuff that Jesus did? Because there was a time after the creation that Satan came to God's creation and tempted them, and they gave in to the temptation, and they disobeyed God, and sin entered the bloodline. And it's been passed down ever since then, so that everyone who is ever born has that in them. And by, you might not be a bad person. You might be a really good person. You might be a moral person. You might be a nice person. You might be the kindest person that I have ever met. But you still have sin in you. Because it has been passed down Amen. through the bloodline. There is no escaping. It's in there. And there's nothing you can do about it. And because God is righteous. And because God is holy. And because God cannot abide sin. Because he is righteous. And he is holy. And he is perfect. No sin can enter into his presence. Because of that. 
we are doomed. We were doomed to spend eternity separated from God. Eternity without hope. Eternity in anguish. But Christ and God did not want that to happen. He didn't want that to happen to his creation. So he made a way that that sin debt could be paid. The only way it could be paid was with a perfect sacrifice. So Christ left heaven. Christ is God. And he left heaven and he put on flesh. And he lived a perfect life so that he was without spot, so that he was without blemish, so that he was without sin. And because of that, he was capable of being the sacrifice that could take away that sin debt, that could pay that sin debt. And that's why he did everything that we've been talking about here this morning. And that's why you need to accept it. Because if you don't, by your choice not to accept it, you have rejected it. And you have chosen to retain that sin. And as I said, no sin can enter into the presence of God. No sin. None. No matter how nice you are, no matter how good you are, no matter how moral you are, you cannot enter in unless that sin debt is paid. And the only way that sin debt is paid is to accept Christ and the sacrifice that he made. And it's not a hard and it's not a difficult thing. And I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people will say, well, if I accept him, I gotta quit this and I gotta quit that and I can't do this and I can't do that. And I'm gonna tell you something, you don't have to quit anything. You don't have to stop anything. If you truly accept Christ, the things that he doesn't want you to do, you won't wanna do. You'll have no desire to do them. You won't have to quit them, they'll quit you. It's not a hard thing and you don't, go and quit all these things and get straightened up before you come to him. You cannot do it within yourself. You can't. It's impossible. You can't be good enough. There is no way. He said, come unto me just as you are. Come and I will take care of it. I will do the work. Because we can't. We are incapable. It is impossible for us to do the work. He has to do it. I think sometimes we get the idea that it is such a hard, difficult thing and, and there's so much that is required of us and there's so much that we have to do that if we're going to accept Christ. It's not that way. It is simple. It is very simple. Here's all you have to do. Realize that what I've been telling you is true. Sin entered into you when you were born because it's been passed down through the blood. There's no escaping it. It's in you when you're born. That's the first thing you have to realize. Second thing is that no sin can enter into the presence of God. Because he is righteous and holy and just and perfect, he cannot allow sin in his presence. Third thing, if I have sin in me and no sin can enter in the presence of God, then I can't enter into the presence of God the way I am. So something must be done. Something has been done. Christ paid the penalty. Christ did what needed to be done to pay that penalty to take away the sin. Well, if Christ did that, why don't he just poof, put it on me and take it away? Because he's not going to force it on anybody. Amen. He also made you with a free will. It is your choice. It is up to you. He did it. He is offering it. You choose whether to accept it or not. And if you choose to accept it, if you realize all these things that I said, and you realize that I need to do that and I want to do that, all you have to do is confess to him that you do realize it. That you know that you have sin in you. And that you know that he paid the sin debt. And that you accept that sin debt that he has paid. And that you ask him to clean you and make you one of his own. It's that simple. As long as it's from your heart. The words don't matter. How you say it, what you come up with doesn't matter. It's just the fact that you have realized you need him. And you go to him and ask him to accept you. That's all it is. It is that simple. Let me read you something in the book of Romans in chapter 10, verse 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. It is that simple. Amen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's that simple. It's that easy. 
I down through time, religion has made it a hard, difficult thing where you've got to adhere to a bunch of rules and regulations and live up to a standard and a code or a doctrine or something. The only doctrine you have to live up to is the one I've already told you. Amen. What it says right here. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. That's it. That's all that's required. Realize you are a sinner and that you need him and confess that. That is it. It's that simple. And again, I want to make this clear. He's not sitting there with a checklist this long of all the things you've got to do first or all the things you're going to have to do after. Because believe me, if you truly accept him and he moves into you and indwells you, the things that are not pleasing to him, you ain't going to want to do. Amen. So you ain't going to have to worry about having a hard time quitting because you're not going to want to do it. Because you're going to want to please him. Because he is now a part of you and you are a part of him. One more thing I want to read you here. I'm going to read what I read and I'm going to read you one more thing. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be Amen. saved. It is that simple. Don't let ideas and thoughts get in your mind telling you you're going to have to quit this, and you're going to have to quit that, and you're going to have to do this, you're going to have to act a certain way, and you're going to have to dress a certain way, and you're going to have to look a certain way. There's no requirements in here on how you look. There's no requirements in here on all the stuff that religion is telling you you need to do. There's no requirements in here on anything other than what I just read you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess Him and accept Him. That's the requirement that He has. He will do all the rest. That's your part. He'll take care of the rest of it. He's already done the work and He will apply it to you. And that's how simple it is. I'm going to say this again. If you don't believe what I've stood up here and told you, and you want to discuss it, or you want to debate it, and you want to talk about it, anything that I've talked about up here this morning, I would love to sit and talk with you and go over this with you and show you the truth of God's Word. I can show you in God's Word. I can show you in history. I can show you in archaeology. I can show you that this was a very real man that came and that fled and that died and that raised again. And he's now sitting on the right hand of the Father just waiting to make intercession for you when you pray that prayer that he talked about. Confess and accept. That's it. I'm done. That's all I have. I would like to just take a minute. If we could all just bow our heads and close our eyes when I ask. Just for a couple minutes for you to examine yourself. And, and think about what you've heard here this morning. I know it wasn't fancy. I know it wasn't all proper English. And I didn't lay it all out. Uh, the way that someone better equipped could lay it all out. But I want you to listen. Not to me but to that little voice that's down inside of you, that little something that's stirring inside of you. I want you to think about whether you have ever accepted Christ or whether you really have not. And if you have not, now is the time that you can. If you just accept that sacrifice he made, that if you just realize that sin has entered into you because you were born into it and that you need to have that blood applied to have that sin cleansed, now is a good time to do that. You don't need anybody to do it for you. You can do it yourself. You can come up here to the altar and pray and somebody can pray with you if you want. You can do it right where you're sitting. It's not where you're at that matters. It's where your heart is at that matters. And I'm going to ask you just to take some time and think about this and let God speak to you and show you your need if you have a need. And for those of us who are here who are Christians, who have been born again, you know, as we walk through this life and as we go through things, sometimes we struggle and sometimes we get weak and sometimes we let down and sometimes we act in ways we shouldn't act or things like that. But God is always there to strengthen you and to forgive you and to pick you back up if you've fallen. He's always there to give you whatever you need. And now is a good time to, to accept that and to cry out for that and, and get what it is that God has for you. As I said, this altar's open if anybody wants to pray here. You don't have to do that. You can pray right where you're at, and God will meet your deed if your heart is sincere. I'm going to pray, and then uh, we're going to turn the service back over to Brother Bob. <coughs> Father, I thank you.
God, for this service, for this time you've allowed us to gather together in your house. Lord, I thank you, God, for this day and what it means to us. Lord, for that resurrection, Lord, for that empty cross, for that empty tomb, for those empty grave clothes. I thank you, God, that you have paid this sin debt, that you have conquered death, and Lord, that now we can have that personal relationship with you. I pray, God, that you would deal and speak with those here, Lord, who are in need of a Savior. I pray, God, that you would show them their need. 